Dear colleagues, I'm pleased to introduce now our three guest speakers whose contribution to our debate will be invaluable. So the first speaker, as it was already mentioned, is Dr. Francesca Dominici, Director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative and Professor of Biostatistics, Population and Data Science at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She's an elected member also of the National Academy of Medicine and of the International Society of Mathematical Statistics. Dr. Dominici is a data scientist whose pioneering scientific contribution have advanced public health research around the globe. Dominici has provided the scientific community and policymakers with robust evidence on the adverse health effects of air pollution, noise pollution, and climate change. Recently, she also authored a study on long-term exposure to air pollution and COVID-19 mortality rates in the United States. Dr. Dominici, I look forward to hearing your insights on the impact of pollution on citizens' health, including in the specific context of COVID-19 pandemic. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. I will share my slide. Um, can you see it? Okay. Yes, yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I am honored and delighted to address you all. I will um, take five to seven minutes to tell you the most recent research on uh, historical exposure to air pollution and COVID-19 mortality in the United States. I think uh, I don't need to explain to you how uh, COVID-19 is now an unmatched public health emergency. And we feel it was really important to start looking at data to figure out whether or not exposure to air pollution can uh, exacerbate the severity of this horrible virus. Um, we are learning um, all together that COVID-19 caused a viral pneumonia and also what is called acute respiratory distress syndrome, which has a very high mortality rate. COVID-19 can cause severe inflammation um, of the heart and the, and the circulatory system. And the majority of that, although things are fluid and evolving, seems to um, occurring among people older than 65. And clearly, many comorbidity, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease can exacerbate the severity of COVID-19. Now, let me, let me tell, tell you in a second, in a minute, what's fine particular matter. Fine particular matter is our very, very small particles. These are air droplets. Their size is 100 of the diameter of a human hair. These are really, really tiny. They penetrate deep into your lungs. So they can get into your bloodstream and they are caused by power plants, motor vehicle, airplanes, residential wood burning, forest fire, anything really that is related to combustion of fossil fuel. We know a lot about health effects of fine particulate matter. There have been thousands of studies uh, all around the world that are documenting extensively the adverse effect of fine particulate matter on our lungs, on our heart, and now there are also effects on our brain. So why investigating the relationship between fine particulate matter and COVID-19? Well, I think that as we were learning more and more, I think it's pretty clear that there is a very a large overlap between the cause of that for COVID-19 and the diseases that are affected by fine particulate matter. And so uh, we hypothesize that the long-term exposure to fine particulate matter could averse the respiratory cardiovascular system and therefore could exacerbate the severity of the um, outcome after you have contracted the COVID-19 virus. We uh, very briefly have been spending, my entire team have been spending years studying the health effects of air pollution. We have gathered the largest data in the world. We are talking about 550 million record and three years ago, we have documented a strong link between air pollution and, and all cause mortality, even below the national ambient air quality standards. So uh, these are massive amount of data that we have been gathered to look at these, um, at these issues. And by the way, I'm gonna go very quickly on this slide, but I'll be more than happy to share with anyone who is interested. 
What we found in our previous studies was that long-term exposure to fine particulate matter increased the mortality risk for all cause of mortality by 7%. And what's really worrisome is that uh, racial minority, black people, Asian, Hispanic, and people of uh, lower socioeconomic status have a mortality risk for, for uh, fine particulate matter that is much larger than the general national average. In the United States, we are facing also this huge issue of environmental justice where Afro-American tends to breed pollution levels that are higher than the white. Uh, these are the levels, this, this, this picture shows the levels of fine particulate matter in the United States that fortunately have been declining over time. However, as you can see, the red line is telling you that Afro-Americans tend to always breed pollution level higher than everybody else. So turning to COVID-19, because we were being building a big data platform to look at the issues, as the pandemic was exploding, we quickly gathered data. This, this uh, slide shows on your left the uh, average of exposure to fine particulate matter in the United States in the last 15 years. And the map on the right shows the county-specific mortality rate for COVID-19. The, our latest analysis include data up to April 22nd. These are results I'm showing you, but we are conducting analysis daily and making sure that the results are consistent. So we explore the relationship between as whether long-term exposure to fine particulate matter is increasing the mortality rate for COVID-19. Data in the United States, I'm really thankful and grateful from Johns Hopkins. They have been gathering daily counts of mortality for COVID-19 for all the counties in the United States. These are data that are verified by the Center of Diseases Control, and that's where we'll be able to get our information. When you are uh, looking at the relationship between fine particulate matter and COVID-19 mortality rate, it's really important that you're not only looking at correlation, but you actually develop sophisticated statistical models that can account for what we call potential confounding factors. So we need to be able to the degree possible to um, disentangle the fact of fine particulate matter from other variables, like, for example, the percentage of people that smoke, the population density, the number of ICU beds. So we gather over 20 variables to try to make sure that the degree as possible, we could uh, isolate the fact, the fact of fine particulate matter on COVID-19 mortality rate from other potential variables. Uh, what this feature shows is that even though these are preliminary results, we found that only one unit increase in long-term exposure to fine particulate matter increased the mortality rate for COVID-19 by 8%. One way to think about these results is that if you take two geographical areas, they are as similar as possible to each other with respect to population density, percentage of people smoking, percentage of people in, in poverty, anything you can think about. And the only difference between these two counties is that one has been has, has had a higher level of historical exposure of PM than others. The one more polluted will have a higher mortality rate for COVID by 8%. What this uh, uh, picture shows on the, on, on the bottom is uh, that uh, these are the, our estimates. They are centered at 8% under very different um, st st statistical models. So, so we run the analysis, for example, excluding the area of New York, and then we want to adjust for Facebook data using COVID-19 symptoms. We accounted from when the epidemic started. So we really try to, to the degree as possible, as I said, to make sure the results were set, were uh, not too sensitive to statistical assumptions. I'll skip this. I think this, uh, this research has been having an enormous coverage all around the world. It started with an article in the New York Times on April 7. I think it's now are particularly controversial issues in the United States, especially under EPA, the, the um, Environmental Protection Agency under Trump, as at the same time in the United States, so there is 
enough time to, to roll back environmental regulation. So I think this is actually later, uh, later to today, I will uh, be uh, addressing the House Committee of Science and Policy and Technology, as uh, there is a really a highly controversial issue so far. Um, I also want to mention that uh, this was a really very interesting article on The Guardian um, on May 4 that not only mentioned our study, but it's mentioning, the, I would say, an entire body of evidence also from my colleagues in Italy, in the UK, in the Netherlands, in China. And there are many, many studies that are emerging. They are showing a relationship between exposure to fine particulate matter and increased severity for COVID-19. To conclude, I think that to the strengths of the study, this is the first nationwide U.S. studies on COVID-19 and air pollution. I also want to mention that all of the data are publicly available, so it's a fully rep reproducible. We found the results are sensitive so to sensitivity, are, sorry, are robust to the sensitivity analysis. But this study has also limitation. I mean, these studies, as all of the study during a pandemic, um, are limited by the fact that, unfortunately, uh, COVID-19 data is only available at aggregated level. So we don't have access to individual level records yet. I hope that will that will become available. And so clearly, it's an observational study. So for as much as we can be sophisticated on our modeling, uh, we also have to make sure that there are no confounding factors. So I think in terms of want to conclude that they put out the public health implication, I think it's really important in this middle of the pandemic, but even after, as it seems that this virus will be with us for some time, I think we really have to give a close look to the, to the, to the counties and geographical areas that historically have been highly exposed to pollution. I cannot stress in, uh, enough the importance of continued regulation of fine particular matter. And clearly, in, you know, people of color and poor people tend to be much more affected. Uh, this is a slide where my I want to show my my team, and it actually it's quite an, of an international team. The, uh, this project was actually led by a graduate student, Zhao Hu, who is from China. Uh, Rachel Nathery, professor at the School of Public Health, uh, Danielle, Be Danielle Brown uh, from Israel, also at the School of Public Health, and Ben Sabat, a data scientist in my team. Here, there is a website where you can get all of the additional information. And that's all I have to say, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, thank you. That was more than interesting. Having said that, I would now like to give the floor to Francesca, Dr. Francesca Dominici, for her final remarks of a couple of minutes, please, so that we also have time to listen to our rapporteur. Yes, thank you. I'll be very brief. I think I wanted to underscore the comments of Susan Gardner, especially for the positive reinforcement loop. I think that actually crisis is a time for optimism. I hope that yet we are going to transition also to have an infectious optimism and in addition of an infectious virus. And I think the infection optimism could really bring humility and working together across all around the world because we are fighting the same enemy. So I think that this is not really only an action plan, although I, I really enjoy learning about the action plan. I think that it is a commitment. This is a moment of ethical reckoning and the commitment is really to transition away from, from a fossil fuel burning to green energy. It will solve two problems. One, immediately we will be breathing cleaner air and second of all, we will combat climate change. And so I was so pleased to hear that everybody was sold on the same page on this. And second of all, I hope that the infection optimism also will create an infection about a commitment toward public health because public health is about prevention. And so the way they with the hair that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat will make us stronger. And instead of treating disease, I think this is really a time where transitioning from, from fossil fuel to green energy will, um, will increase public health all around the world, will make us stronger, will make us healthy, and we will make stronger to fight additional pandemics that we know will come our way. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It has been a unique experience and I learned a lot from all of you.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dominici. I mean, it came through, um, as I mean, I basically we were reading articles and we found, uh, you know, the, the, as you mentioned, some of these articles about your research and that's how we came to know about your work. But I think you managed to really uh, prove uh, and, and, and show us the body of evidence that uh, hints to this inc incredibly important and worrisome correlation between, uh, of course, pollution and, and our health, and in particular with COVID-19. So thank you for your remarks. 